Hello everyone, it's John Buck, uh, back with an yet another discrete time linear systems video. Uh, and today we're going to talk about uh, properties of the discrete time Fourier transform, particularly that just as we saw in the Fourier series, there's a strong link between what we do to signals in the time domain and what happens in the frequency domain. When we shift things or scale things, multiply, convolve them in time, we can say what that's going to do to the Fourier transforms in frequency and vice versa. So it's like the cubes I showed you or the blocks I showed you uh, for the Fourier series, that, that we, these things are really like just two different perspectives, sort of like taking our signal and turning it 90 degrees to look at it from a different angle. And so from that point of view, it's not surprising that if we do something to manipulate the signal or if we define one signal in terms of another in the time domain, we can also talk about how one Fourier transform relates to the other in the time domain as well. So in this video, we're going to talk about the properties of the discrete time Fourier transform uh, and, and see, uh, and I'm just going to go through and discuss some of the common ones and explain uh, how they're similar to the things we've already in, seen in the Fourier series. So rather than like, we shouldn't panic that there's this whole new set of properties to learn because uh, they're actually very similar in their structure to the ones you've already started learning from the Fourier series. And so you can just build on the foundation you already have there and just see how they change just a little bit uh, in the exact details, but, but in the overall structure, they're very similar. Uh, so again, just to remember, our discrete time Fourier transform definition says x of e to the j omega is this infinite sum of x of n e to the minus j omega n. So this is, again, our recipe. It tells us for a given signal how much magnitude and phase x of e to the j omega is a complex function. So it tells us how much of each frequency is going into the signal and what the phases are. And this is actually our recipe. This says, here's how I take the recipe and how much of each exponential I combine under the integral to get back the original signal. And so these things aren't equal, but rather they're a pair. And so we sort of write them with a, uh, we can write them in a couple ways, Oop. but with a, a script FT, sort of a cursive FT over the arrow to say that these correspond to each other or a relationship between them in the Fourier transform domain. You might also see some people will write this uh, in an operator notation, which is also, uh, so you, they'll put almost like it's a, a, a function in a computer program that says I put x of n into the function and I get out x of e to the j omega. It's a common convention that we match the letters, that we use lowercase in time and uppercase for frequency, sort of give our brains a clue that if the omega wasn't enough, that, that this uppercase means that we're now living on the frequency side. And one of the, uh, so, so let's talk about some of the properties here. Let me get back to the top of the page. So again, these are common properties that will transform properties we'll see a lot in the class. Assuming I have, we're going to start with uh, three signals. X of n has Fourier transform x of e to the j omega. A y of n goes to y of e to the j omega. And some, in a few cases, we'll need a third signal, s of n that goes to s of e to the j omega. The first important early property to remember is that the Fourier transform in discrete time is always periodic. So in omega. So x of n doesn't need to be periodic, right? That's the big change we've made going from uh, Fourier series to Fourier transform is the time domain signal is not periodic, but this is periodic in omega every two pi which is similar to what we saw before. Remember the Fourier series repeated in K every N samples based on the period. Well, this turns out to be periodic and that comes actually directly from the definition X of E to the J omega. If I put omega plus two pi into the definition for omega, if I go back here and look at it, this becomes omega plus two pi. Uh, why, why don't I just carry that through actually now that I'm thinking of it. I wasn't planning to do this, but I'll sort of improvise on the fly. If I go evaluate the Fourier transform at omega plus 2 pi, right, I just substitute that in here for omega. And I can use properties of exponentials to write this as x of e to the j uh, omega n and e to the minus j 2 pi n. But because n is an integer, this is cosine of 2 pi n for some integer, which is always 1, plus uh, minus j sine 2 pi n, which is always 0. So it turns out, 
very quickly follows from properties of exponentials. Or, or also, if I think of this as a complex number in polar form, it says if I go around the unit circle by minus 2 pi, I get right back radians right back where I started. Uh, and so it must be back at, on the real axis at 1. And so this is very quick from the definition to show why it must be periodic, because the time is always an integer. So that's a very important fundamental frequency, or fundamental property, rather, right from the start, is that it's always periodic in omega for every signal in discrete time. If I take another important property is if I take two discrete time signals uh, and scale them and add them, the Fourier transform is linear. So the, four, the Fourier transform has the same scaling and adding. I have additivity and I have scaling. So s of e to the j omega will be the same constant a times x of e to the j omega and the same constant b times e to the j omega. And this is what we call the linearity property. Uh, another property we see, we'll see a lot is what happens when I delay a signal in time. If y of n is a shifted version of x of n, well, it turns out... Oh, I'm not going to go through the derivation. You can find it in your book. But what's more important is to know that what it does is multiply by e to the minus j omega m times the same Fourier transform. So I have the same x of e to the j omega just multiplied by this complex e to the minus j omega m. And then it also runs in the other direction, that if I shift in frequency, I end up in time multiplying by a complex exponential just with the opposite sign to the exponent. And so at first glance, these look a little different, but big picture, they almost essentially like they rhyme mathematically. Right? In the Fourier series, we saw a shift in time, so take the Fourier series and multiply it by a complex exponential. The same thing is going on here. We take the Fourier transform, multiply by a complex exponential, and we shift in time. And we still have this nice duality thing that if I shift in frequency, I multiply by a complex exponential in time. So that idea of shifting and multiplying by a complex exponential, they're sort of like they, they always appear together. If you do one in one domain, you do the other in the other domain, and then you just need to make sure you get the signs of the exponent and everything sorted out. But again, we have this sort of uh, duality property, right, that we see that when we do shifts in one domain, we see the same type of thing happening in the other. And better still, it's the same type of thing we already saw with the Fourier series. So it's not like you're starting from scratch. That's why it's important to think of these things first at the conceptual level and say a shift in one domain is a comp multiplying by a complex exponential in the other. And as I, I keep going down the page here, keeping the time on the left and the frequency on the right, if I convolve two signals in the time domain, right, here's now my infinite convolution sum. This it turns out to be one of the most important properties we have is that I end up multiplying the Fourier transform one frequency at a time. So at each omega, I take x at a given omega times y at a given omega, and that gives me the new output Fourier transform s at a given omega. So if one of these, if I replaced y by h of n, this would be an LTI, LTI system. We'd be saying, I, if I want to understand an LTI system in the frequency domain when the input is not periodic, I'm just multiplying the Fourier transform of the input with the Fourier transform of the system if, if it was an h, h. And the same duality thing is going on that if I convolve in frequency, I end up multiplying in time. And so that when I, this is what we would call a convolution integral in frequency, but it's the same thing in going through one point, one n at a time and multiplying the two. So, so again, I have that, that duality going on, that multiplying on one side is convolution on the other. And I sort of have this crossover effect. But again, the main idea is the Fourier transform on one side, convolve in time, multiply in frequency, one frequency at a time, or multiply one point in time at a time, multiply them n by n together, and I get a convolution in frequency. So another property we didn't really talk about in periodic signals, you don't use it quite as much, is what happens if I flip something in time, right? If I have y of n is x of minus n, then we end up, 
actually that we're flipping in frequency also. That it's the same as saying I've got e to the minus j omega in x, y of e to the j omega is x of e to the minus j omega in frequency. So these are a bunch of properties about manipulating signals. Uh, they're also symmetry properties, the same as we saw in the Fourier series, similar to the ones we saw in the Fourier series. Again, they kind of rhyme in some mathematical sense. They're not exactly character for character the same, but they have the same big picture concept. So if I have a real x of n, it turns out the Fourier transform of x of e to the j omega is the complex conjugate of e to the minus j omega. We call this conjugate symmetric. So that it, if I flip the omega axis, I just take the, the op, I change the sign of the imaginary part. Another thing is what happens if I take a Fourier transform and take its real part and then do an inverse Fourier transform, what I get back is, is what we call the even part of x of n the conjugate even part, which we sometimes also write as, as x sub e of n. And we saw this back in chapter 1, is x of n plus the conjugate of x of minus n, which if my signal is real, I can ignore that conjugate. But just to be complete, sometimes it turns out to be important. And so things that are real in frequency turn out to be conjugate even in time, just like things that are real in time are conjugate even in symmetry, uh, conjugate symmetric in frequency. And similarly, if I, instead of taking the real part in frequency, I take the imaginary part, so it should be a j times the imaginary part, I get the odd part here. And so it's x of n uh, times the conjugate of x of, or minus the conjugate of x of minus n. So again, uh, things that are odd in odd conjugate odd in time end up making things that are imaginary in frequency. And so putting all those together, oh, I've got these, this should be the FT, all together, if I have something that's both real and even symmetric, then x of e to the j omega will be is even and real. So the, the realness makes the even in the other domain, even in one domain makes real in the other. And so that's an uh, important combination of the symmetry properties. And the last one I'll mention is, oh, I didn't update, I wrote this down wrong, is, is we still have a Parseval's relationship. And again, the big picture is the same, which says if I take the sum over all time of the magnitude of x of n squared, I'll have the integral over the one period, I just need to worry about one period of x of e to the j omega, I take the magnitude squared of that, d omega. So whether I add up the magnitude squared in time, which is the total energy in time, or I do the integral of the, of the energy and frequency, this 1 over 2 pi is a bookkeeping detail, don't get too hung up on it. But I have the same energy basically whether I add things up one sample at a time or one frequency at a time, whether I'm, I'm doing the bookkeeping either way. I get the same total energy, which again is re remembering our wooden blocks is a bit like saying the block has the same volume, whether no matter which side I look at when I'm adding up the energy. Okay, so that's a quick tour overview of the Fourier transform properties. They are uh, a little different because the time signal is not periodic, but again, at the high level properties, things act the same. So I always I really encourage students to try to think about them first at the high level, say shifting in one domain is multiplying by a complex exponential in the other. Or multiplying two things in time is convolving in frequency, or vice versa. Convolving in time is multiplying them in frequency. If you think at that high level first, then you can always use your notes or the, the table in the book. The book has a nice table of properties to sort out what uh, what proper, or like the exact details of, well, what's n, what's m, what's a positive exponent, what's a negative exponent, until you get to know them better. Don't waste your energy worrying about memorizing those details. Think about the big picture concepts so that helps you recognize when you can use them, when you can apply them and other problems that we'll see as we go on. All right, that's plenty for this video. Uh, I'll stop here and I'll see you next time.